Great. Everyone can hear me fine? OK. Uh, hello. My name is Craig, and I'm going to be talking about two new color code circuits and the open source decoder that I had to implement to compare them. This is work that I did with Cody, with Cody Jones. Each of us came up with one of the circuits that I'm going to be showing to you. Uh, I came up with the one that you're going to see we call the middle out circuit, and Cody came up with what we call the super dense circuit. So let's talk about color code circuits. The color code is a stabilizer code. It's defined by a set of stabilizers that you just keep measuring. Uh, on the right side of this slide is a picture of a color code. In this picture, the hexagons and the trapezoids are indicating what we need to measure. Each shape is two stabilizers, an X stabilizer and a Z stabilizer. Uh, the hexagons are six body stabilizers and the trapezoids are four body stabilizers. In a lot of ways, the color code is similar to the surface code. It's two dimensional, it's planar, it has a good threshold, it's topological, all that good stuff. However, the color code has things that the surface code doesn't. In particular, because the X and Z stabilizers are perfectly lined up on top of each other, the color code gets transversal single qubit Clifford gates. So in the surface code, if you wanted to do a proper Hadamard gate or an S gate or something, you end up having to use an amount of operations that's O of D cubed, typically, whereas in the color code, those operations will cost O of D squared. And when you're expecting your distances D to be around 30, say, that's a big advantage. The other really interesting property of the color code is that errors are noisier. So because each qubit touches three shapes, every error has three symptoms instead of two, like it would be in the surface code. So it should be harder for them to hide. So it seems like there's more ability to catch errors. The cost you pay for these benefits is that the color code has bulkier stabilizers than the surface code. So they're weight six in the bulk instead of weight four. And that means that at every moment, your stabilizers are taking 50% more noise, and you need 50% more operations to measure them, and they'll spread hook errors 50% further. So really, the question of whether the color code is better or worse than the surface code kind of comes down to whether these noisier errors with more symptoms compensate for the increased noise your stabilizers experience due to being larger. So we're going to talk about color code circuits, uh, and here's possibly the simplest color code circuit you could make. You add an ancilla qubit to each shape, connect it to the data qubits of that shape, and then use the ancilla to measure the stabilizers one by one. Uh, the circuit is not very good. It needs a lot of layers to measure the operators, and the ancilla qubits have a lot of neighbors, so there's high connectivity. And hook errors created by the circuit are reducing the distance, so the circuit's not doing anything to compensate for hook errors. So we don't want to use this circuit. Um, here's another type of circuit we wouldn't want to use. So previously, we were doing time multiplexing. This is space multiplexing, where we add two ancilla qubits and measure the stabilizers in parallel. This makes the circuit a lot faster, but it's still cutting the distance in half due to hook errors, because it's not compensating for them. And actually, even worse, the connectivity here is not even planar anymore, which is not good if you want to put your color code on the surface of a chip. We don't want to use this circuit either. Those other two circuits are really just simple examples, not serious suggestions. Uh, here's a circuit that people have actually used in a paper. It adds two ancilla qubits to each shape. But instead of using the double ancilla qubits to run faster, it uses the second ancilla as a flag. So this fixes the hook error problem. That means there's not going to be a distance loss in the circuit relative to the code. Uh, it also does this cool thing where it manages to accumulate onto both ancilla qubits simultaneously, which saves layers. Uh, here's a picture of a hook error being caught, so you can sort of see why the flag helps. Uh, so this Z error is happening halfway through the cycle, and normally it would spread to two data errors, potentially cutting the code distance in half. But the Z error also propagates into the flag measurement, so you get a warning that this may have happened, and that's enough to fix the issue. Uh, I could keep going over circuits that people have proposed in papers, uh, but honestly, there's a lot of them. In this talk, it's only half an hour long, so I'm going to move on to our circuits. Uh, here's Cody's circuit, which we call the super dense circuit. Um, so I showed you a circuit that was doing multi uh, time multiplexing and a circuit that's doing space multiplexing. This circuit is doing what I might call basis multiplexing or maybe bell multiplexing. It prepares a bell pair and then relies on the fact that X flips and Z flips can both accumulate on both qubits. 
So this is the same trick that superdense coding uses to send two bits uh, over one transmitted qubit. Uh, it's very similar to what the flag circuit was doing. Uh, it's just that we've replaced the flag with the measurement of the other stabilizer. So this makes the circuit faster. Um, but the really cool part is that it's still flagging. So here, if you look at what a hook error does in this circuit, it will spread to multiple data errors, but it will also cause a detection event in the other basis. So this is why there's no distance loss in the circuit. But it does require you to account for the fact that a detection event in one subgraph might be telling you something about the other subgraph. So you have to do kind of correlated decoding. Um, here's some stabilizer flow diagram showing how this circuit operates. So how it measures and prepares the stabilizers that it's supposed to. Something interesting I want to point out is that the X basis preparation touches a measurement. So you can see like the, the red lines touch an, an M. Um, so it gets this minus one term based on the measurement sign. Um, whereas the Z preparation doesn't have that. Actually, if you look at the full circuit, you find even more of these little asymmetries between how the stabilizers move in each basis. So for example, once you think about how the circuit interacts with itself when it's running next to itself in a full tiling, you find that these flows get tweaked a little bit and they kind of leak into the neighboring regions uh, in a way that can touch their measurements. The result is that in one basis, the detection events are computed as the parities of triplets of measurements instead of pairs of measurements. Whereas in the other basis, it's sort of the more typical, I compare two measurements. Ultimately, this doesn't really change anything. It's maybe just a little weird, a little confusing and surprising if you're not expecting this. Um, it still works. The other circuit that we put in the paper was a circuit that I made, which is what we call the middle out circuit. The idea behind this circuit is that the color code state appears in the middle of the cycle instead of at the end of the cycle. So it occurs halfway between the measurements instead of at the measurements. And also you're alternating between folding different stabilizers into single qubits instead of accumulating them onto ancillas. This hurts on layers. So you can see this is sort of a long circuit. And it also hurts on distance because it's not doing anything to compensate for hook errors. But it does achieve the best gate count per check. So the number of CNOT gates you have to perform in order to get a measurement that you can detect a problem. Um, also, it doesn't have any ancilla qubits at all. So there's no space overhead. Um, but really, I want to focus on this CNOTs per check idea. Uh, basically, although if you count the gates in this diagram, you'll see that it seems like there's too many. The key thing is when you tile this across the, the actual triangle, you find that a lot of these CNOT gates are doing double duty. They over, they're just the same CNOTs in both of them. So a lot of them are doing double duty at computing checks. And the reason you'd expect this to be very helpful is it just gives less opportunities for noise to get into the system. Uh, here are the stabilizer flow diagrams for the middle out circuit showing how it measures and prepares the stabilizers that it's supposed to measure and prepare. I think the main interesting thing here is that what the stabilizers are doing when they're not being measured, when the other stabilizer is being measured. So like you can see in the bottom right at least in this isolated case, during the X basis measurement, like in line with that M in the bottom right, the Z stabilizer is a three body operator. So there's three of the lines that have a blue highlight on them at that point. And this kind of raises the question, um, okay, that's what it looks like in the, not, in the isolated case. What does it look like in the full case? Like what do the stabilizers look like during the measurements? Because you know normally people build error correcting circuits in a way that the state, the code state, uh, happens during the measurements. So if I gave you this circuit and told you what code is it measuring, that, that's what you would look at. Um, so the color code state appears halfway through. What appears at the measurements? Like what, what is code is this circuit really implementing? Um, here's a screenshot where I entered the circuit into Crumble and then tracked all the stabilizers to see what they looked like. Um, it's hard to tell from this picture because the straight lines make it impossible to see which qubits are skipped or included along like the long vertical lines. But in the bulk of this circuit, uh, away from the boundaries, uh, these shapes are five body operators, so five qubit stabilizers. Uh, the surface code is four body stabilizers, and the color code is six body stabilizers, and this is five body. Also, if you look at how many stabilizers touch each qubit, you see that there's actually variation some of the qubits are touched by two, and some of the qubits are touched by three. In the surface code, each qubit would be touched by two, and in the color code, it would be three. 
So these, these numbers kind of suggest that this is some kind of interpolation between the surface code and the color code. Um, I mentioned this weird code to Dave Bacon, and he realized if you rearrange the qubits into two layers in 3D space, the stabilizers perform square-based pyramids, and they kind of interlock in a nice way. Uh, this gives a very nice picture of what the bulk of this code looks like, definitely better than the picture on the previous slide. Uh, I went looking to see if anyone had described this before, a five-body code that fits on two layers like this, and I wasn't able to find anything. So we might be the first to notice that it exists. Um, which kind of suggests an interesting way to generate codes is to make a circuit for an existing code and then look at the stabilizers of that circuit as it operates and just see if you find something interesting. The codes that you find this way have to be extremely related to each other because they're part of the same circuit. Um, so like here, the pyramid code, we, we call this the pyramid code. Um, we know that it must have a constant depth uh, must have constant depth single qubit Clifford gates because the color code has those things and this is very few gates away from the color code. Uh, and I don't know, I kind of wonder if you did this step of making a circuit and going to a different layer many times if you might actually be able to get to interesting places. But that's not what this talk is about, so I'm gonna move on. In the pyramid code perspective of this circuit, the numbers move around a little bit. So that perspective makes it look like the circuit is more time efficient and less space efficient. Of course, it's the same circuit regardless of how you look at it, but I guess it kind of calls into questions these numbers that I decided to show, if it's so easy to move them by factors of two, makes them kind of very subjective. Um, but fortunately, we don't have to rely on these subjective numbers. We can get objective numbers. Instead of trying to eyeball which circuit looks better, we can just simulate them and measure which one is better. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna sample the circuits, we're gonna decode them, we're gonna count how often they fail, except we don't have a decoder because when we came up with these circuits a year ago, we had no way to decode them. Um, there are multiple open source code decoders for the surface code, um, but as far as I can tell, there were zero available decoders for the color code. It's kind of frustrating, actually. People put all this work into writing papers about color code decoders, and then they don't make them available. They just let them sit away on some computer somewhere that no one can touch. So then the next person has to do it all over again, and this is just the kind of thing that sucks up years of grad students' lives. Um, and at least for this specific thing, we're gonna fix it. We're gonna implement the decoder. So let's talk about decoding color codes. Um, in a color code, if you put an error on a data qubit in the bulk, it will produce three symptoms, a red one, a green one, and a blue one. That's, that's why we use a three color tiling the way we do. Um, there's no way in the bulk to make a green symptom by itself, or a green and blue symptom without a red symptom. All errors in the bulk preserve the fact that the number of red symptoms, green symptoms, and blue symptoms is equal mod two. Uh, the reason it's only mod two is because if you put two of them next to each other, they can cancel out at particular places, so like the two greens and the two blues cancel out, leaving the two reds. Um, so it's easy to add two red symptoms, you just can't add one by itself. Um, also, a measurement error will produce two symptoms of the same color. So this, this R equals G equals B mod two conservation property is absolutely key to how you decode the color code and also to why it's fault tolerant in the first place. Um, the only places where you can violate this are at the boundaries, so at the sides or at the corners, you can get colors by themselves. And so the decoding problem kind of topologically comes down to which side do I send the excitations to? Do they match in the bulk, or do they match to the left, or the right, or the bottom? The decoder's job is to look at the color detection events you get and to try to come up with errors that would cause them. So here I'm drawing errors as lines between the symptoms. So the goal is given some colored points, find edges that connect them together so that each point is explained. Um, a crucial thing here is if you have one line of each color, so a red line, a green line, and a blue line, they can meet together and create an uncolored virtual node. And this is also sort of what makes this problem hard, is you don't know how many of these virtual nodes you're supposed to use, you don't know where you're supposed to place them, and so the decoder has to figure this out in addition. So the, like it's sort of like the problem isn't telling you the things you'd like to know, you have to figure them out. Um, shorter edges here correspond to more likely errors, and so what you want is a valid solution that uses as little line length as possible. So for example, on the left, 
Um, you see you can match these two red events and these two blue events together, but it's more efficient if you have them sort of merge together into a green line, and then you only have to travel a long distance once instead of twice. And also you can see that the correctly positioning the virtual nodes is important if you want to get the minimum distance. Uh, so that's the problem, what's, what's the solution? Well, we don't know the solution. For surface codes, or at least for single basis decoding of a surface code, we know how to efficiently find the most likely error set. Uh, we use the Blossom algorithm, uh, and that works very well. For color codes, we don't know if there's an efficient way to do it. It's kind of crazy, actually, that we don't know this. We don't know an efficient way to do it, like we don't know a polynomial time way to do it, and we also don't know that we can't do it in polynomial time. Like, no one even knows if this is NP-complete or not. Uh, so as a result, existing decoders currently are either slow or approximate, and we don't know if it's possible to do better than that. An example of an approximate decoder is the restriction decoder. The key idea it uses is that if you delete one of the colors, the partial problem that's left behind is solvable by Blossom. So from this, you can create three partial problems, one for each color, solve them, and then try to put them together in order to form a full solution. Uh, Sahai and Brown realized that the restriction decoder could be improved by linking the partial problems together at their boundaries. So it turns out at the boundaries that they fit together, uh, it's a little trippy to think about, but it works. For the normal triangular color code, this creates a combined subproblem where the topology of the subproblem is a topology of a Mobius strip, which is why they called this the Mobius decoder. Um, it's not really the greatest name because there's all kinds of variations in layouts of color codes and only some of them produce uh, Mobius strips. Is the moderator so high? <laughs> uh, well, I like the name. It's not very apt, but it's... <laughs> I mean, we, we took it for hours as well. Um, so like uh, this picture on the right is an example of a combined subproblem sub where it's not a Mobius strip, but it's still put together at the boundaries. Um, so what I decided to do was to implement this decoder to compare our circuits. Uh, I called the implementation Promobius, so I kept the Mobius part of the name. And uh, you can go use Promobius right now if you want to. The source code is available on GitHub. Also, you can install it as a Python package. Um, I would say the main difficulty I ran into when implementing Chromobius is that it needed to work on circuit noise, but the original paper only really describes what to do for code capacity noise. So like, I had to figure out how measurement errors, uh, how the measurement errors are mapped into the subproblems and how they're lifted back into the full solution. Uh, I also had to reframe a lot of the rules that the paper used so that instead of being based on global properties, like knowing you're on a triangle, they're based on local properties, like this R equals G equals B mod two conservation in the bulk. Uh, I won't go into the details or the various corner cases that make this tricky, just be aware this wasn't just implementing, it was also a bit of algorithm design. Uh, and I'm pretty happy with the result. Um, in particular, because of this focus on local properties, Chromobius can understand things with pretty complicated global structures that you might not expect it to work on, like lattice surgery or braiding, because um, these things don't really affect the local structure or global. It doesn't really know about them, and so it understands them by not understanding them or not caring about them. It's also very fast, in big part because it uses pi matching to solve the subproblems, and pi matching is very fast. Um, here's a plot showing Chromobius is very fast. These curves are, are actually for quite a large variety of different situations, like phenomenological noise and circuit noise for various different circuits. And what you can kind of see is it doesn't really matter which circuit you're running you get roughly the same speed until you start getting close to the threshold and then things get really bad. So this is why I can kind of give an explicit number and have that kind of mean something to say that, oh, I can do 300 kilohertz detection event decoding with Chromobius without worrying too much that you'll see different numbers due to the specific circuit you use it on. Um, I'd be more worried about the number being wrong because your computer is different. Um, for comparison, pi matching decodes at around two megahertz, which is about 10 times faster. It has to be at least three times faster because we're turning it into three subproblems and solving each of the subproblems. Um, so there's a little bit of room for improvement here, um, but I would not consider this improving the speed the highest priority at the moment. 
Now, although I wrote Commodious and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm proud of it, there are several things about it that bother me and can be very troublesome. Uh, first of all, Chromobus requires the user to manually color and basis annotate the detectors. So for every detector you declare in the circuit, you have to say this is red or green or blue, and this is X or Z basis. I would really prefer not to have the user do this, but I don't know any reliable way to infer this information from an unannotated circuit. It seems like it should be possible, but it also seems like it's really close to hard problems like three coloring. So I don't know a way to do it that uh, I feel would work well. Um, this could potentially be fixed. Um, and if it was, it would be enormously helpful because it's kind of a pain to have to annotate this every time. Uh, secondly, and this is the consequence of having to label things X or Z basis, Chrome just kind of can't understand the transversal S gate. So it can like understand these complicated lattice surgery braiding things, but that it can't do like a single layer of S gates. Um, and the reason for that is because what the S gate does is it sort of sends your X detectors to the product of your X and Z detectors. And so at the location where you have the S gate, your subgraphs kind of merge or touch each other. And because you have to label all of the detectors as X or Z, the labeling just doesn't support this concept. So you know, with this labeling problem where you can't see the label, um, I would say this is like the main thing I wish I could fix. A less embarrassing thing is that Chromobius can't understand color codes that cycle between measuring stabilizers in all three bases instead of just two of them. So if you have a color code, I've described them as having two stabilizers for each square, but the product of those is the third stabilizer, and you can just directly measure that. And there are reasons to think that cycling between all three bases might do better than alternating between two of them. But the problem is this kind of introduces a perpendicular second concept of red, green, blue coloring across time in addition to across space. So like in a normal color code, if you have a detection in one round, you can move it to another round by inserting a measurement error. But when you're doing these triplet measurements, you have to move it to two other uh, measurement error, uh, two other detection events. And it's just, it, it seems like you'd at least need like nine subproblems maybe in order to make it work, and I didn't want to think about that. So you can't do that with Chromobius. Uh, I would say it's actually probably not possible to solve this because it's like so deep down in the, in the way you approach the problem in the first place. Or sorry, when I say it's not possible, I mean I don't want to modify Chromobius to do this. Other things that bug me are that there's a few things you can do wrong where you'll get no warning that you've done anything wrong until while it's actually sampling and decoding, it just raises an exception, like I failed to lift the solution. Uh, for example, if you make a repetition code, and the like, Chromobius can decode a repetition code, but you're still forced to color it, and if you use all three colors kind of randomly, you'll create situations where solutions are local in the subproblems, but would have to go to a boundary in the global problem, and it, it just falls apart. So there's kind of this tricky, make sure you only use two colors inside parts that are matchable, and I have no way of checking that you've done that, or knowing what's matchable and what's not. So sorry if that fails. Um, another thing is, because it splits the problem into X and Z subgraphs, it doesn't really have the ability to understand correlations between them. Uh, and also, kind of for similar reasons, it doesn't really understand flags or erasures. But we have a decoder, so let's run the circuits and let's compare them. And it turns out the winner is me. <laughs> so this is using uniform depolarizing circuit noise with a noise strength of 0.1%. So we're, we're kind of opinionated about the noise as opposed to the size. We're, normally when people draw these diagrams, they're opinionated about the size as opposed to the noise. Um, along the horizontal axis, we're varying the size of the color code. Um, because the different circuits all have different qubit overheads, I'm plotting this qubit count on a square root scale as opposed to like, as opposed to like saying the patch diameter because the patch diameter is not enough information to know how many qubits you're using. Um, the vertical axis is error rate, lower is better. Lowest here is the surface code with the decoder that understands correlations between the X and Z subgraphs. Uh, this is an internal decoder that we have that we haven't open sourced and maybe we will at some point, I, I don't know. Um, above that is the surface code decoded by pi matching, which you can do by installing pi matching. And then above that is the middle out circuit. Um, interestingly, it has the same slope as the surface code line, so it's improving as quickly when given more qubits. So its marginal cost is matching the surface code, and it's just starting from a slightly worse place. 
and then above that is the super dense code, and then above that is some other case that I haven't talked about where we tried variations in the tiling we use for the color code. I'm not gonna talk about it because the conclusion is that it's not really good as you can see. Um, now in addition to comparing to each other, we can also compare to previous work. This is actually kind of tricky to do well because people haven't been really seeing their code and if you recall, that's why I had to write Comorbius in the first place. So we can't really extend their results beyond what's shown in their papers. Also, because they don't publish raw numbers, we're, we're just like eyeballing points on plots to do these comparisons. Um, in related news, uh, here's a Zenodo link with all of our code, the circuits we built, and the data we collected. Do better. Uh, <laughs> anyways, the interesting thing here is that at a noise strength of 0.1%, the middle out circuit is solidly ahead of prior art, or at least the prior art we can compare to. But at 0.01%, so 10 times lower, prior art is pulling ahead. This is almost definitely because the middle out circuit is sacrificing code distance to make the circuit smaller, to have fewer CXs per check. Code distance it gets more useful as your error rate goes down, so that trade-off starts not being worth it eventually. So that's why you might expect this sort of thing. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is that we know for a fact that Chromobius is very suboptimal at decoding. In fact, we found a case that's particularly galling. So it turns out you can take a toric color code, that's a color code on a donut, and by deleting the right stabilizers in each basis, you can create a problem that's not just matchable, but is actually fault tolerant when decoded by matching. Uh, so this allows us to compare Chromobius using all of the information, all the stabilizers, to just a matching decoder, or to Chromobius only given the same information as that matching decoder. And it turns out it does a little bit better when you tell it less information. And this should never happen. This is a very clear indication that it is not using the available information in the bulk and that there's room for improvement. Um, so that's, that's, you can see that as kind of like depressing or maybe kind of hopeful. Like look at all of that space between that green line and that red line that we could improve if we just knew how to activate that information. And the middle out circuit is so close to the surface code that it seems like if you just manage to turn this on somehow, the color code will suddenly be better than the surface code, where previously it's historically you know, been slightly behind. Well, actually, hold on. Do you remember that I said at the start that the super dense circuit flags hook errors, but that the flags are in the other subgraph? And then I also said that Chromobius separates the two subgraphs, so it's not actually seeing the most important advantage of that circuit, uh, which would mean we're kind of still in the same place we were at the start, which is that we don't know which circuit is better really because we don't have a decoder that's good enough. So we're right back where we started and that's my talk, thank you. Thank you for that talk. Uh, if people have questions, please come up to the mic at the front. Sorry, I got here late, so if this has already been answered, you know, uh, with me. But uh, if you want to use um, an uncorrelated X and Z uh, decoder uh, and you're worried about correlations, why not uh, use BP first in order to uh, get um, you know, an, an independent uh, set of error channels for your... I mean, that sounds like a reasonable idea. That I didn't do that. That, that might work. Uh, I will say one thing I did try is I tried running the subgraph problems through a correlated surface code decoder, uh, and that made things worse. So it, um, at least the simplest thing to try didn't work. But yeah, using BP to reweight edges sounds like it could help. Hi, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I was wondering, uh, when you talked about um, Y checks, like the XYZ and the XZ, um, what cases uh, would it be beneficial to do Y checks? Could you just talk about doing Y checks in general? And well, for example, um, in many cases when you're doing lattice surgery, you're limited by how quickly you, the, the measurement stabilizes. And if you're alternating X and Z checks, then if I break all of the X checks in one of the stabilizers from when I began a lattice surgery to when I ended it, that'll break it. If I do this X, Y, Z thing, then it looks like I have to break the X and Y checks, but not the Z check. And so the time-like distance is like you're getting two-thirds efficiency instead of half efficiency on it. 
So you, you might expect it to be faster at lab surgery. Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, very, ni very nice talk, thanks. Uh, my question is, um, since the, uh, the mo uh, most likely error decoding is mp hard problem, we can't expect a deterministic polynomial time. So the comparison between decoders is really about accuracy and versus time. That's right. right. Is there any way to establish a benchmark that you can compare them fairly? Uh, like wh which I decoder ach achieves a better approximation better? I mean, definitely you could just make a scatter plot of speed mm -hmm. and accuracy and just look at it. I think it's hard to pick a given metric because depending on your use case, you'll have different requirements. Like if you want to yeah. do decoding in real time, you have a very, very strict time constraint and right. you just do the best you can within it. Whereas if you're um, doing simulations or you're maybe more interested in some kind of physics question about the threshold, then you might want to spend a lot of time. I see. Um, yeah. So it's more like uh, some, some of the decoders um, can, uh, can run longer to have a higher accuracy. So each decoder is really about a curve, not just a single point. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, in this case, Grolius is one point because there's no way to, vit, to tell it to use more time. Got it. Um, Got but it. you can definitely have decoders with that property. Okay, Maybe you have you. some, I don't know. This is related to your point of having going between X, Y, and Z. I was wondering if there's a version that could be used for like the flokeified color code and decoding that. Uh, I don't know. I don't know enough about the Floquet color code to know for sure. I know that like the honeycomb code, like the Floquet surface code, uh, shares most of the properties of the surface code, definitely at the, I think the topological level it does, but the microscopics are totally different, potentially. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question, sorry. Thanks. Hi, Greg, it was a nice talk. Um, I was just curious as to how the super dense code went with decreasing P because you're intuition was that um, the prior art improved the decreasing P, but the super dense did as well. Yeah, we, we did mostly focus on this 0.1% noise rate, so I, I don't think I know the answer to that question even. Um, but also, like I said, Chromius doesn't understand the crucial thing that it needs to in order to see the expected effect there. So like, from as far as it knows, it's a D over two distance circuit instead of a distance D circuit, which is really why the comparison wasn't fair. Um, I'd like to ask the next speaker, Hugo, to come up to set up. And if I'll also ask a question. You talked about the fact that you can implement cross-code lattice surgery with Chromobius. Are there any limitations on that? And um, do you expect to run into the kind of problems you expressed with like colors clashing in different codes? No, because the lattice surgery is really expressed at the kind of macroscopic topological level, kind of independently of the microscopics of the circuit. Um, all of the stuff that Chromobius is using is, is really about the microscopics, and so it, it's just independent of this detail. So I would not expect any difficulty making lattice surgery or braiding work in almost any context, which is ironic given that like the S gate, which is just like a microscopic change is kind of why that fails. Um, yeah. yeah, I actually have a, a test in the paper where we do lattice surgery between a color code and a surface code, and it successfully decodes that. Right, uh, thank you.